our teenagers. Put your hands together for our teenagers. Amen. All of our teenagers headed out to be ministered to. Woo! Man, that song ministers to me. I pray. You know what the purpose of song and music? It's supposed to put something in your heart that you meditate on throughout the week. You know, you can hear something on the radio, you know, an old song that you can, and it'll, you'll be humming it at work. It ain't even playing, right? And it gets in your heart. And so God designed music and songs to be that way. So this song should really be in your spirit through all the week. Fill my life till all they see is you, right? Glory. And then you start meditating on it, and then you get revelation, right? How it fits for your family, how it fits for your children, how it fits on the job, right? I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you. All right, y'all not going to take my time with this song. Man, that was good. <laughs> Man, that was good. Hey, man, Brother Johnny, do me one more favor. I don't want them to close that. I want it to be in front of that column and that column before we go live. We're not live yet, right? We are live. Well, welcome, everybody, from Facebook. Praise God. We're about to give you a word from the Lord. Amen. Hold up your Bible or whatever you use for your Bible and say this out loud. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible, so I make this confession that I will meditate therein both day and night, Monday through Friday, one chapter in the morning, one chapter in the evening. And because I do, my life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah glory to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray that this song will be a testimony. It'll be our prayer that you will fill us today with your word and change us into the image of your word so that when people experience us, they experience you. Whatever is in our lives that's not like you, we want it out. Take it out. We yield ourselves. We humble ourselves to you, God. Speak to us today through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're continuing a series that we started last week, and so we're going to open our Bibles to Mark chapter 5. In verse 21, it says, Now when Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. He begged him earnestly, saying, My daughter lies at the point of death. I want you to imagine this for a moment. Jesus is doing what he does. We know he's a healer, a miracle worker. He was very famous in the day in which he lived. People knew that if you can get to him, doesn't matter how impossible the situation was, if you can get to him, he could turn that thing around. Jairus is in a bad situation. Daughter is in trouble. Maybe you're here and you've got a child that's in some trouble. Future doesn't look good on the path that they're headed on. This girl was at the point of death. This man came to Jesus, fell at his feet, asking for help. He said to Jesus, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands. on. I know you've laid hands on people and they've been healed. Come, lay your hands on them that she shall be made, that she, that she may be healed. And begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter, um, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, of course, time would fail me to tell that she came to Jesus, snuck up behind him, grabbed hold of his clothes, and got healed. Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? And everybody was like, well, everybody's touching you. He said, no, but something went out of me, and this woman realized, and she, she told him it was me, and she told him how she had been sick for 12 years. But remember, Jesus, Jairus is, Jesus was on his way to help Jairus, but now he's interrupted. 
I don't know if you've ever been there where you and your family are in a bad situation and things aren't moving fast enough. Maybe you're starting to be worried that he won't get there in time. Have you ever been there where you said, that's exactly what I didn't want to happen? Come on, think about that. Have you ever been there where something happened and that's exactly what I was trying to prevent? Your fears, the thing you greatly feared came upon you. I want you to imagine that you're Jairus standing there watching Jesus take the time to listen to this lady tell her story. And sure enough, in the next verse, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. But while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Not that she's dying. She's dead. She stopped breathing. She's not moving. She stopped breathing and stopped moving when I left the house on foot or horse. And how much every time it took me to get here, maybe even if you were close, she's been dead for a moment. Well, it's over. What's the use? I mean, when a situation is dead, is there's no hope. But God. But how will Jairus react? Will he react like with you in faith that God can still move in a dead situation? Maybe you feel like you're in a dead end relationship or you're on a job and you feel like there's there's really no future here for me. How do you respond when you're given a bad report? So somebody came from the synagogue, the ruler of the synagogue's house, and he said, your daughter is dead. They said that while Jesus was still speaking. So I want you to imagine, how many of you been in a conversation with somebody, but you can hear another conversation going on? So Jesus is talking to this woman saying, daughter, your faith has made you well. While he was saying that, somebody came and told Jairus, your daughter's dead. Don't trouble the master any further. And as soon as Jesus heard, while he was still speaking. How many of y'all know God could be talking to you but listening to what's going on? Come on, somebody. As soon as Jesus heard that the word that was spoken, he turned to that ruler of the synagogue and said to him, do not be afraid, only believe. But why, Jesus? It's too late, right? She's dead. What, 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 what does it matter now? And then also ask the question, why did he so immediately turn? Because he doesn't want to give fear the chance to prevent him from doing only what he is able to do. There must be then, if you could go back to the blank screen, there must be then something about fear that can nullify the miracle power of God. Because as soon as Jesus heard that he got a bad report, the first thing he tried to get him to do, look, don't be afraid. Meaning, I I still got this. And you might be in a situation where it looks like hopeless and there's no future. And what God has sent you to Faith Family Church today is to say to you, I got this. But the only thing I need you to do is don't be afraid. So can we talk about the subject of fear for a couple more weeks? So they, they, they immediately head towards the house. They get to the house. People are crying. The girl's still dead. And in verse 41, the Bible says that he took the girl by the hand and he said to her, she's dead. He said, he spoke into a dead situation. He said, Talitha Kuma, which is to say, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. So we're in this brand new series that we call the opposite of the, the opposite faith. Not the opposite of faith, but the opposite faith. For example, the opposite of faith is doubt. With, with that is unbelief. 
The opposite of faith. The opposite of believing is not believing. But we're not talking about the opposite of faith. We're talking about something called the opposite faith. You see, in this, I need you to go back to the blank, uh, the, the, that one. Thank you. Because if you put that up, they'll look at it. Amen. So sorry, y'all. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to set this up. Fear is a kind of faith. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen that. But the Spirit of God, months ago, put it on my heart to show you from the Word of God that fear is actually a kind of faith. And it actually works in opposition to the kind of faith that we're supposed to have and that we're supposed to live by. If the faith that we know could work in reverse, it would be fear. If we could reverse the polarity and get the machine of faith to work backwards, to undo, come on, to bring the opposite result, then it would be, that faith would be called fear. Because fear is the opposite faith. So this, this series is about seeing fear from a different perspective. There must be something so detrimental about the subject of fear, which is a, is a kind of faith, that Jesus responds so desperately. He responded immediately. And if you've ever heard any messages about fear, you, you know that the Bible talks so often about it. There are actually 365 different commands to fear not or to not be afraid in the Bible. There must be something about this subject. That's of great importance. The goal of this series is to get you to fear not and to believe only. So after we've gone from last week to this week, and we're only going to do two more parts, the goal at the end of the day, we want you to live a faith-filled and a fear-free life. How many of you all are accepting this challenge to live fear-free? So today, the title of the message today in part two, today we're going to talk about what is fear. Last week we talked about fear being a different kind of faith. But what I want to show you from the word of God today is what fear actually is, the definition of it. Now, since fear is a kind of faith, if we can understand what faith is, because fear is a kind of faith, we could then understand what fear is because fear is a kind of faith. So what is faith? Faith, if you were to look up the Greek word for faith, which is pistis in the Greek dictionary, faith is a firm persuasion. It's a conviction based upon hearing. So, for example, faith is a firm persuasion. Now, remember, God's word does not redefine what faith is. In other words, this Greek word pistis or faith, as we see it in English, existed before Jesus even walked on the planet. The Greek language was before Jesus was born in a, in a manger. Come on, y'all catch up with me because y'all are going slow at this part. <laughs> How many of y'all know different languages have been around for thousands of years, right? And so the Hebrew language was already in its, own, in its origin before Jesus was born. You know, Abraham, Isaac, they spoke Arabic, so forth and so on. Hebrew, they, spoke, they were the Hebrews. They had their own language. And so for centuries, thousands of years, they spoke a language and people understood the language. When Jesus showed up, one of his main ministries was to teach people about faith. And he used a word out of their language that people understood. And so when he in one occasion said, have faith toward God or have, fa have the God kind of faith, he didn't redefine a word. The word is what it is. Like water is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. So when you look at the word faith, it is simply a firm persuasion. For most Christians, if you were to ask them to define or what faith is, they would use Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1 as the definition because it's spiritual. But remember, faith is not spiritual. It's a word that we all have used and live by. For example, 
The word says, with, uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that sounds spiritual, but that's not what it is. That's actually what faith does. So when, what do you do when you want to understand what, a, what something is or what a word means? You go to the, come on, dictionary or the concordance to find out what does this word mean. So this Greek word means, and all it means is a firm persuasion. So, for example, when you came in, I used this illustration last week, you sat down because you were firmly persuaded that that chair would hold your weight. Is that true? You didn't check it to see if it was working. You didn't check to see if the seat was screwed together, if the legs could, you didn't look at the specification to see if it could hold your weight. You didn't check to see if somebody was pranking you. Come on, come on. Right. You just sat down when you put the key in your car today. You didn't check the battery cables, the spark plugs. Come on. You, come on. You, you didn't do a diagnosis and see if that when you turned this, you got in and, unless you drive a hoopty. <laughs> you might have said a prayer. You might have popped the hood. You might have got a jump. I don't know. Because you weren't persuaded that it's going to start, right? But for most of us, we got in the car, turned the key because we were firmly persuaded. We had no doubt in our mind. As a matter of fact, it surprises us when something doesn't work the way that we believe. When you put a piece of mail in the slot, you do it by faith. You're firmly persuaded it'll get to its destination. Sometimes you might have a little doubt, but generally faith is understood by all. When Jesus came, he didn't redefine the word. He just redirected it. Don't have faith in your natural experience. Have faith in God's ability to change what you're dealing with. But then now, so there's natural human faith. That's one kind of faith. There's the God kind of faith, right? Faith in God is the God kind of faith. And then also I'm showing you today that there's this other kind of faith, and it's the opposite faith. But as it is with the God kind of faith, it's still a firm persuasion. You're firmly persuaded that God's going to get you through this situation. Come on, you don't have no proof. You didn't check it out. You just believe God's going to pull you through, right? You're firmly persuaded. You're convinced based upon this experience that God's going to get you through. Matter of fact, if it's not firm, it's not faith. If you're iffy about it, if you're unsure that God's got you or going to pull you through, then and it's not proof. It's a persuasion. Faith is not proof, right? And so it works also with the subject of fear. Fear, when you really want to understand it, it's a firm persuasion. You are firmly persuaded that something bad is going to happen. You're firmly persuaded that something's going on that you don't want to happen. And as a result of that, you are convinced, based on that experience, that the outcome is not going to be as you desired. Faith and fear are in the same class. Now, my assignment today is to actually take that definition of a firm persuasion and a conviction based on an experience and to plug it into four stories, Bible stories, where individuals were faced with impossible situations and they could choose either to be fearful or they could choose to be full of faith. The reason why God's given me these four stories to show you in the word is because you, like them, might be in a situation right now and you're afraid. If truth be told, you believe that something bad is going to come out of it. Are you all ready for this today? Go with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers. Let me prove this definition by looking at the word of God at some examples. In Numbers chapter 13, we're going to read the whole chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter. In Numbers chapter 13, God told the children of Israel to go spy out the land. He sent 12 spies, and in the beginning of Numbers 13, They go in, they walk the land. I think they were there for like 40 days. They bring back fruit of the land, and they bring back a report. And in verse 27, the Bible says, they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. 
Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land. The Hittites are there. The Jebusites are there. The Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites are down there by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And Caleb quieted the people. He did what? He quieted the people. That must mean that they were bringing this report and telling them, yeah, it's a beautiful land, but these people, there are armies there. There are warriors there. There are the descendants of Anak there. And they're all over the place. And the people are starting to be unsettled by what they're saying. Caleb is realizing that something is happening in them and he moves to intervene. He says, hey, hey, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him, they said, we're not able to go, Caleb. We can't go up against this people for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a what? A bad report. Now come on and talk to me and connect with me today. Jairus received a bad report. Have you ever been there where you went to the doctor and he gave you a bad report? They're saying there's no way that this is impossible, that this is incurable. Maybe you're in a relationship and it doesn't look good, it looks bad. Maybe you're in a financial situation and it doesn't look good, it actually looks bad. It looks like if things go in this direction, we're not going to end out the way that we're going, that we want to be. Well, you have at that choice, you have a choice at that moment to believe that somehow, some way, good's going to come. Or you have a choice at that moment to believe that something bad is going to come. They gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which uh, they had spied out, saying the land which we had gone as spies in the land devours the inhabitants. All the people of whom we saw were men of great stature. What you talking about? We saw giants in the land. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. Think about this for a moment. Y'all remember the story of David and Goliath? Well, they were the Philistines, and they were in the land that God had promised them, right? This is long before Goliath. Actually, Goliath is one of the descendants of Anak. Goliath was nine foot six. Shaquille is what, seven something? You know, um, what was the guy played for Houston? Yao Ming? You know, like, you know, it's amazing to see people like a 7'6". How about two feet taller than Yao Ming? Walking around. There was one giant that had six fingers on one, on one hand, on each hand, and six fingers and six toes on each foot. Somebody say yuck. <laughs> they're, they're going into the land seeing these monstrous dudes, much stronger than them. It looks really bad. They come back with a bad report. We saw ourselves like grasshoppers compared to these guys. And sure enough, look at what happened. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 14, uh, if I could just set it up just for a moment. So how would you respond to what looked like a very difficult or impossible situation? There's only two ways you can respond. You can respond in fear Or you can respond in faith. They did not have a good response. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse number 1, the Bible says that all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people, listen, they lifted up their voices and did what? Their response was they spent all night crying. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> come on. And as I was preparing this message, I sensed in, in my spirit, whether it be online or here in the church or at the 830 service, there's some of you that you've been doing a lot of crying lately because of the situation that you're facing, because of what's going on with your children or what's going on with your finances. And, you know, you figured that at this age in your life that you wouldn't have to borrow a little bit of money to pay something that's just basic. Maybe your, your back is up against the wall on the job and they're not treating you with the respect that you should, should have earned and, and so forth and so on. And yet you find yourself crying about it. 
Because of fear, they ended up crying. The second thing we noticed, the people wept that night, so they're crying all night long. Well, they get up the next day in verse number two. They get up the next day and all the, the children complain. That's the second C that you need to write down. Fear will not only cause you to cry about your situation, it'll also cause you to complain about your situation. They cried all night and then they started complaining against Moses and Aaron. They, the whole group of them said, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, you know, if we had only died in this wilderness. Notice they're complaining. I can't stand this job. I don't like this. Why? They, they complain about the traffic. They're complaining about the food. I just, if you're doing a lot of complaining in your life could it be that you if you're complaining because you're afraid that something is not going to turn out i just got too much mic i feel like i'm yelling at you all am i too loud <laughs> if you're doing a lot of complaining about your job is it because you're afraid that this won't turn out the way that you wanted it to that's what fear is you're firmly persuaded that this is going in the wrong direction See, God can turn things on your job. God can turn things in your home. God can turn things with your children. And when you have faith, you won't complain about it. You'll believe God's got it no matter what it looks like. The third C I want you to write down is this. In the next verse, they questioned. They cried. They complained. And they questioned. Somebody said, that ain't a C. Well, it sound like a C. Fear will cause you to start asking a lot of questions. Why has the Lord brought, this, brought us into the land to fall by the sword? Now you're blaming, you're questioning God. God, why would you let me get into this relationship? Why would you cause me to come to this city? Why would you cause me to take this job? God, why did you allow this person to do it? Why, why these, why, come on now. You're crying, you're complaining, and you're questioning. <laughs> Why? Because you're full of fear. And I'm going to show you this in Scripture. So let me move up. Let me, let me hurry up. They're questioning. You know, did God bring us out here so that our wives and children could become business? You know, wouldn't it have been better for us to stay in Egypt? That was bondage. They were slaves. But notice what's happening. So they said to one another, let's go. Let, let, let's get somebody. Let's. Forget Moses. You know, we leaving Moses, and we're going to get another leader, and we're going to go back to where we were, right? They got a better idea, right? And they're going opposite direction than where God said. Well, notice what happened. Moses and Aaron, they fell on their face when they heard that before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who spied up, they tore their clothes. Sure enough, in the next verse says that they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel saying the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. What are they trying to get them to believe? They're trying to get them to believe that even though this is bad right now, it could be better. Even though this looks impossible, there's still hope. Even though they are big, our God is bigger. They're trying to stir up faith in a seemingly impossible situation. I'm of the generation of Caleb. Come on, I'm of the spirit of Joshua. And I'm trying to get you to believe that no matter what you're faced with right now, God can still move. But in order for him to move, you've got to be free from fear. Because fear will nullify your faith. Well, did they believe that? The Bible says, if the Lord delights in us and he will bring us into the land and give it to us, in the land which, the, which flows with milk and honey, and, and, and only, listen what they, they tell them, do not rebel against the Lord. What does the word rebel? It means to go against or to go in the opposite direction. See, fear will lead you in the opposite direction. Why? Because it's the opposite faith. It works in the wrong direction. He said, only do not rebel against the Lord, the Lord, nor do what? Fear. Come on, why? What is he doing? He's doing just like Jesus said to Jairus. Fear not. Why? Because fear will mess this situation up. It'll actually cause a bad thing to happen. Job said, the thing, the thing 
that I greatly feared came upon me. And the thing that I dreaded actually happened. Have you ever been there in a situation and you said, that's what, that's what I didn't want to happen? You went in to talk to your boss because, you know, you're trying to figure. And you went in and you left out fired. You thought you were going in to clarify something. And you left out without a job. And that's, ex that's the opposite of what I wanted to happen. <laughs> Fear can cause bad things to happen because it's a kind of faith. He says, no, don't fear the people, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. The Lord is with us. And he tells them a second time, do not fear them. Their response was all the congregation said, you know what? Let's stone Joshua and Caleb because <laughs> let's stone them with stones. <laughs> Come on, right? They were absolutely convinced that there, there's no way that we can win in this situation to the point where they just wanted to get rid of the person that was speaking about faith. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in the meeting before the children of Israel. My question to you today is whose report are you going to believe? In Isaiah 53 and verse number one, the prophet asked that question, whose report will you believe? When you're at the doctor and you get that bad report, when you go to school and pick up your child and you get that bad report, when you get that call in the middle of the night that you've been dreading, some of you, the phone rings and it's, you, just, you just believe it's going to be your, your adult child in a bad car wreck or you believe, I got to talk to somebody today. If you are living your life afraid, you are opening the door to the devil to do the exact thing that you don't want to happen. Jesus immediately told, get fear out of your life. Don't let fear in your life because fear is the last thing you want in a bad situation. Why? Because it'll bring that thing. Come on, it'll open up that door. My question to you is who has believed our report? Joshua and Caleb had a good report. The, the other spies had a bad report. Whose report will you believe in your marriage? Whose report will you believe in your finances? Some of you are afraid that you'll never get married. Oh, see how quiet it gets? Because it's real. The Bible says that fear, that all of us, all our lifetime, were subject to fear. I remember, and I, this is a real life experience that's happened like over 20 years ago. I've been in pastoral ministry and in training since 1994. I remember this woman told of a story of how she found out she was a teenager, and she found out She was there in the moment that her mom found out that her dad had been cheating on her. She saw the devastation occur at the moment of that bad report. What is that child subjected to for the rest of their life? saw something devastating happen. Watch this. A child like that can grow up being afraid that something like that could happen to me. And struggle from relationship to relationship fearing that this other person might be doing something. I have met men over the years, I remember I pastored in Phoenix, Arizona and different places across the country and Florida and Canada and different places. And it's a common thing for a spouse to believe that their spouse is doing something and they're not actually doing it. But in their heart, they believe that something's going on. And in reality, now there are occasions when people believe something's going on and something is going on. But there are occasions, and what I'm talking about is the fear of it. 
Not the reality of it. The reality of it is neither here or there. Can I, can I explain to you what that means? How many of y'all know you could be uh, afraid of your car being repossessed? And your car can actually be repossessed. How many of y'all know that's two different things? I mean, you could be like one month behind and afraid that they're going to repossess the car. You leave a little window blaze and you, I mean, you are rabbit. You are like, I mean, you're crying. You're complaining. You, you, come on, you're, not, you're losing sleep. You're thinking that the, every tow truck you see, come on, y'all going to let me preach this message whether you like it or not. Some of us, on the other hand, we ain't afraid. You can come and get it if you can find it. For, I ain't afraid. You know, one person like three, four months behind in the car payment, they ain't afraid at all. Come and get it. I, you know, they're fine. I just won't have it, right? So just because you have the threat or the possibility that you, your response can be a world of difference. What I'm talking about is being afraid of something bad happening. There have been situations where people are afraid. They have no proof. Remember, it's a persuasion. It's not proof. They have no proof. But in their heart of hearts, they believe that something is happening. Let me give you another Bible story. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse number 1, it happened after this that the people of Moab and Ammon, these two armies, and then a third army, others with them besides the Amorites, they came up against Jehoshaphat. In this story, you are Jehoshaphat. Does it feel like not only do you have one issue that you're dealing with right now, but there's another issue that you're dealing with? Not only are you dealing with this where your child is concerned, but you're also dealing with this financially, and you're also dealing with this in your body. How many of y'all know, you remember the movie The Perfect Storm? The Perfect Storm is about a ship that was caught in the middle of three different storms. And the enemy likes to put on the pile-up technique. He doesn't want you to, you know, he doesn't just throw a financial problem at you. He wants to get you into a perfect storm so that you can go topside, right? He wants to throw something at your body. He wants to throw something at you financially and then hit you with something in the relationship all on one day. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get you to quit. Well, this situation confronts Jehoshaphat. Three armies are gathered together. Some of them came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are, are already, they're close up on you. They're in En Gedi. And sure enough, in verse 3, Jehoshaphat responded like so many of us do. He feared. I looked up the definition. He feared. <laughs> he was afraid that something bad was going to happen because three armies are coming up against him. But he did one thing that I encourage you to do. You might have an army, as it were, up against you, but set yourself to find out in the midst of this crisis, God, what do you want me to do in this situation? He feared, but then he set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I don't have the time to read it all. Um, it's Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. So everybody got together and they came to pray. Sure enough, from verse four all the way down, we, he, he prays one of the most anointed prayers. But then he gets quiet to hear what God would say to him in this moment. And again, God brought you here to get you this message because you can't afford fear. He, you can't you can't afford to have fear in your life with what you're facing. What you're facing is big, it's serious, and it can take you out. But in this moment, I'm, I'm speaking to you strong. I'm speaking to you straight. I'm speaking to you with the same intensity that Jesus spoke to Jairus because this thing looks really bad. And the only way to get God to turn this thing around is to live fear free. So they got quiet before God. In verse 13, it says, now all Judah and their little ones and their wives and their children, they stood before God. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel in the midst of the assembly. And the Bible says that he said, the Spirit of God came on him with a prophetic message. And I believe this series is prophetic. He said, listen, all of Faith Family Church, I mean Judah, and you inhabitants of Houston, I mean Jerusalem, and you, Pastor Stan, you too, Thus says the Lord to you, 
do not be, come on somebody, afraid. Why? Because fear can take this bad situation and bring it on you. God says to him, just like Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. There must be something so detrimental about allowing fear in your heart that it prevents God from doing the miraculous. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed because of this, this giant, this great multitude. Why? Because the battle is not yours, but God's. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, go on to work. Tomorrow, make them lunch. Send them to school. Come on. Love them anyhow. Act like everything is okay. Go on out there. They'll surely come up. It'll look bad. It'll look scary. It'll look monstrous. And you will find them at the end of the brook in the, uh, before the wilderness. And sure enough, in verse 17, he says, you will not need to fight this battle. But what does he say? He says, position yourselves. The position that you're taking is a position of faith and not a position of fear. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Oh, Jerusalem, he tells them a second time. Come on. Do not what? Fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against him. In other words, no matter how impossible this situation looks, if you keep yourself from being afraid and stay in faith, God will turn this situation around. The next one. In Mark chapter 4, how many of y'all remember Jesus was in the back of a boat, sleep on a pillow, while the boat was filling up with water? Y'all remember that story? The Holy Spirit took me to that story to, again, emphasize how critical fear is in a crisis. You can't afford to be afraid when you get a bad report. The doctor may say it's gone from this level to that level. You can't afford to believe that this is the end. You've got to believe that God's got me no matter what. I'm not afraid of dying. You know, you could be afraid of dying. You know what? They say that all phobias are tied to the fear of death. There's some of you that today, right now while I'm speaking, you may not be faced with a mountain, but you won't get in a swimming pool to save your life. <laughs> Why? Because you're afraid of water. Well, you drink water every day, so are you really afraid of water? No. What are you afraid of? Drowning. Come on, right? You're afraid of getting in the water and drowning. Really, what you're afraid of, you're dying. Some of you are afraid today of flying. Some of you are afraid today of driving on the highway. Some of you are afraid today of going over a bridge. Some of you are afraid today of something happening bad. And what I'm saying to you, you cannot allow fear in any area of your life. Satan conditions you all your life to fear so that he can have a foothold and the Bible says give no place to the devil. Now I'm not saying go down to Galveston as well. I ain't afraid of water no more. <laughs> you wading out there. You don't know nothing about it. No, but you know, take some swim lessons. That's an act of faith. You know, get a nice safe time during the week and drive on the highway. Don't allow yourself to be afraid. I'm preaching good. Let me get on with it. Jesus was in the back of the boat, sleep on the pillow. I'm almost done. He was in the stern of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What are three things that fear will cause you to do? Cry, complain, and question with a C. They're questioning Jesus. Listen to the question. Jesus don't you care that we're about to die? Does Jesus care about you? Don't you know that? But to them, you couldn't convince them that Jesus doesn't care. And when you meet somebody who's going through a tough time, they are convinced that God doesn't care because he's allowing them to deal with what they're dealing with. They're so convinced out of fear. Come on. But he was in the stern of the ship. He gets up. He rebukes the, and, and arose and rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, peace be still. And the, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. Does God have the ability to deal with the storms in your life? 
He absolutely does. But it's got to be fear free. Notice his response. He said to them, why are you so what? Full of fear. Get it out of your life. Somebody say, get it out of your life. How is it that you have no faith? My last story is this. And the reason why I took the time to set this up is because, and this is the one the Lord gave me, but he, he put the, the one. So they were with Jesus in a boat going from one side to the other side. And a storm blew up, started to fill the boat up with water. It looks like they're about to die. And all along, Jesus is sleeping in the middle of a storm. Come on, somebody. So they wake him up and they question him. Don't you care? And he's like, why are you like, Jesus, why wouldn't I be afraid? They're talking about shutting it off. Come on. This is there's this is a shouldn't you be worked up? No, Jesus is not. I got this. I can handle this. God's got this. Come on. Right. So now in Matthew 14, they are in another boat, but this time, go back, I need to set it up. They're in a boat, and Jesus is not with them this time. <laughs> and a storm blows down on the lake. They're supposed to, Jesus sent away the multitudes. He says, you guys, get in the boat, go to the other side. How many of y'all remember Peter walking on the water? This is that story, but let me set it up, because you got to really go there in Scripture, right? So, so they're in a boat. They're not with Jesus this time. Here comes another one of them crazy storms. And they are, and if you look at it in other translations, they are about to die. But this time Jesus is not with them. Have you ever wondered why Jesus walked on the water? Put your hand up if you've ever, if you've heard that Jesus walked on the water. It's the only man I've ever heard that walked on the water. Not Elijah, not Moses. You know, they part the sea, but nobody walked on the water. Okay, since then, after then, period. That's the only one biblically I know that ever walked on the water. But have you ever thought about why did he do that? Was he just exercising his, you know, godlike ability to step out and walk, walk? I mean, have you ever tried to walk? I've tried to walk on water. <laughs> Maybe you're not like me, but, you know, if you're a lifeguard and I was a lifeguard, I'd be at the, the pool all day long and nobody is there. And you're sitting there, there looking at that steel body of water. It looks like you can walk on it. And then you get the idea. I wonder how far I could walk on water. So you back up a bit and you get you a good head full of steam and there you. But really, when you're meditating and reading your chapter this week, ask the question, why did he walk on water? I submit this to you. If you look in the story, he's in the mountain praying, but I believe he sees in the spirit that Satan's about to flip that boat. They are afraid of dying. And he's not. Last time he was with them and they felt like they were dying. He's not with them. And I believe he sensed it, and it was so urgent that he walked on the water supernaturally. He was firmly persuaded, I got to get there. I got to get to them to turn this situation, right? And so he believed, and he firmly, and he walked on water by faith, okay? So he gets there. But do you know in the story, the Bible said it looked like as though he was going to walk by them. Do you all remember that? Now, think about that. How many of y'all know it's not good to startle people? Right? Matter of fact, show the verse. In verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost, and they cried out for what? Fear. So check this out. This is interesting. So Jesus, in one translation, it says that it was as if he was going to pass them. Now, there are times that I come into the house, and I've startled my wife, and it makes me feel bad because I don't want to scare. I don't like when people jump out behind the door to say, boo. Because what you're doing is you're trying to scare a person. You're trying to instill fear in them. That's why I don't watch horror movies, right? Because they're trying to do, you know, to get you to jump, right? So how many have ever come in the house, hey, you know, you're making a little noise, right? So you Because at least where I'm from in Detroit, you don't just walk up on people. <laughs> you startle them, you might get hit. Oh, is you? Oh, my bad. You all right? So I believe he was as if he was going to walk by, not because he was just on a journey to walk on the other side of the lake, but just not to as far. I mean, think about it. When they did see them, they were like, oh, he's a ghost. <laughs> they think he's a ghost, right? 
And they were they're crying out for fear. So thank God that it, he, didn't, he didn't just walk up on them like, hey, you know, they probably had a heart attack. <laughs> so imagine Jesus walking on the water to get to them. He doesn't want to startle them. So it's almost like, and they see him, they're crying out for fear. And then look what happened. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It's me. Do not what? Come on. How many of y'all see the crises? If you all keep this fear going, it's going to turn out the way you don't want it to. So first thing you got to get out, stop, fr- stop being afraid. Calm down. Stop being afraid. Notice the next verse. Well, this gets a little strange. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. That's a bold thing. Well, Jesus said, come. Peter, when Peter, now watch this, he came down out of the boat. Amen. Brother Michael White, he's got a nice boat. And if you've ever been in a boat, you actually have to climb out of the boat. That's on the deck. You got to climb out of the boat down to get to the water. You know, depending on how big the boat is, right? So I want you to imagine this when you read this this week. Jesus, if that's you, come. Now, he was far enough away that they didn't recognize him as him. They thought he was a ghost. And he cries to him. He says, if it's you, come. He says, well, it is me. Come. So Peter, now, he gets down out of the boat, and he does what? He walked on the water to go to Jesus. So I was wrong. There were two people in all of humanity that walked on the water. Jesus and Peter walked on the water. And it didn't say he stepped on the water. He what? Walked on the water. And in order for something to be a walk, it's got to be a multitude or a few steps, right? He gets down out of this boat. Now he is walking on. How is he walking on water? By faith. He's firmly persuaded in the one word, come, that Jesus has got me. That even though I've never seen or heard of anybody ever walking on water, I see Jesus doing it, and I'm persuaded if he could do it, I can do it. Come on. If Jesus can face death and come out with life, then you can face the situation that you're going through and know that it's going to come out right. Woo, that was good. Ah, glory. Now watch this. So he says, I'm convinced based upon what I've experienced with God that I can do what he did. He gets down and he starts walking on water. He's doing it by faith. But notice, I'm almost done. But when he saw the wind, now the wind was already boisterous. That's why they were thinking they were going to die. But when he's in the midst of this situation and he sees, you don't want to miss next week because we're going to find out how do you get fear? How do you end up being afraid of never being able to get married? How do you end up in a situation where you're afraid that you'll never be a success in life? How do you end up in a situation where you're afraid that that things aren't going to turn turn out right for your children? How does fear come? You don't want to miss next week. Today we're just talking about what what fear is. It's a kind of faith, and it's a firm persuasion. And he was firmly persuaded that he's about to drown. And beginning to sink, he cried. What does fear make you do? It makes you cry out. It makes you question and complain, right? So he cries out, saying, Lord, save me. Now, before, have you ever seen something begin to sink? A boat can begin to sink. You all remember the Titanic? And then you remember when it turned up vertically? And then it just went down. Come on, somebody. (laughs) A boat begins to sink. Anything else you drop in water doesn't begin to sink. If you took a block, a five-pound block, and set it on the top of water, will it begin to sink? No, it's going to sink. If you tried to step out on the water as a human being, do you kind of like start going down a little bit? No, right? You, you've ever been there? As soon as you, it's like, poof. something's happening here. He's becoming afraid and fear is nullifying his faith. Didn't happen all of a sudden. So you've got fa- I'm walking by faith. But I'm looking at the situation and I'm more, I'm, 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 I'm afraid that maybe Jesus don't got me. I know you got me. You all remember the man that had the child and he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. 
he was believing at the same time as he was doubting. Is it possible for you to be in faith that God can do it, but you're afraid that it might not work? Oh, man. Go ahead and stand up because I'm just like totally done. Wow. Did you all get anything out of this today? Anybody glad they came to church today? Jesus immediately reached out, and then they walked back to the boat on water and got back in the boat. And he asked him, why were you afraid? Why did you have little faith? Why did you doubt? Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. I want to pray for you. Father, I believe you've given me a prophetic word to help us to see how bad fear is and how important it is for us to not allow ourselves to be afraid of what we don't want to happen to happen. Teach us, God, over these next couple of weeks as we learn how does fear come and how does fear work. Teach us how to live a faith-filled life and a fear-free life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Before I dismiss you, I do want to ask if you're here and